Hello, and welcome to this webinar titled Regulatory Approval of Three Rapid Microbiological Methods for Mackie Product Release, hosted by Biopharma Asia Magazine and presented by John DeGood, Senior Director of Research and Development at Rarocell Corporation, and Nicola Reed, Senior Product Manager at Charles River Microbial Solutions. My name is Stephen Edwards, and I'll be your moderator. Now, please allow me to introduce our first presenter. John DeGood is Senior Director of Research Development at Verisol Corporation in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Verisol Corporation acquired Genzyme's Cell Therapy and Regenerative Medicine, or CTRM, business in 2014. As a principal scientist, Mr. DeGood was responsible for developing, validating, and transferring molecular biology assays for rapid microbiology and cell differentiation applications managing complex projects to implement process changes and using statistical process control tools to implement process analytical technology for cell therapy products. He has been with CTRM since 1995. Before taking on his role in R&D, Mr. Degood managed quality control cell therapy operations at Genzyme for over 10 years, where he designed and implemented a comprehensive CGMP compliant raw material program controlling 300 to 400 parts and participated in 16 vendor audits, directing four as lead auditor. He also represented QC during 10 FDA inspections and numerous audits from international regulatory authorities as a subject matter expert in material inspection and release, biopsy accessioning, endotoxin testing, mycoplasma testing, analytical methods, flow cytometry, laboratory failure investigations, assay validation, and data management. Mr. Degood received his Bachelor of Science degree in Chemistry in 1986 from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor and taught analytical chemistry in 2000 at Northeastern University in Boston, Massachusetts. Prior to joining Genzyme, he worked in analytical research at Abbott Laboratories' Pharmaceutical Products Division in North Chicago, Illinois, and then as a scientific consultant for Massachusetts Biotechnology Company at Arthur D. Little in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Involved with the pharmaceutical and biotechnology industries for over 20 years, Mr. Degood has technical and management experience spanning all phases of the product lifecycle from early research and development through CGMP quality operations. I will now be handing over to our first presenter. Welcome, John. Thank you very much, Stephen, and hello to the audience. I first wanted to thank Adam and Stephen at Biopharma Asia for giving me this opportunity to speak. Oh, not moving. Okay. <laughs> the agenda for this portion of the webinar includes a description, some background information on Vericell's products, a description of the methodology, validation, and implementation of three rapid methods relevant to these products, that are approved by both EU and US regulators, and an update on some work that's been going on at the United States Pharmacopeia Convention, or USP in the US, um, evaluating adding a rapid sterility test to the compendium. So this is Vericell. Vericell, as Stephen mentioned, is located in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's uh, nestled between MIT and Harvard University. And what we do there is we manufacture autologous cellular therapy products. So let's break that down a little bit. Autologous means that the tissue donor and recipient are exactly the same person, so there's no risk of immune rejection. And a cell therapy product um, uses the body's own cells, in our case, for um, regenerative med medicine, uh, reconstruction uh, for burn patients or, um, or um, regeneration of cartilage. So briefly, the way that the processes work is a surgeon will take a tissue biopsy from a patient and then they will send that to our lab in Cambridge where we isolate and expand the biopsy cells in-house to make the product and then that product gets returned to the surgeon, which is implanted back into the same patient in a surgical operation. So inside the facility, 
This is all of the products are manufactured in class 10,000 clean rooms, um, class 100 biosafety cabinets. I realize those are the, the old designations. Um, so for our products, we have two currently approved uh, products that are on the market, autologous cell therapy products, and those are Epicel and Macy. Epicel is where it all started for us. It is a permanent skin replacement product for patients with deep dermal or full thickness burns over greater than 30% of their body. Typically, we treat patients that are greater than 60 or 70% of their body, so this is truly a life-saving technology. Jim Reinwald and Howard Green developed this technology at MIT and Harvard back in the 1980s, giving rise to biosurface technology, the original um, iteration of our company at the site. Cardicel then was a cellular suspension of chondrocytes. Cardicel is not on the market anymore. It was replaced by the next product I'm going to talk about. But Cardicel is a cellular suspension of chondrocytes to treat cartilage defects in the knee. And Genzyme acquired Biosurface Technology, the company that developed Epicel, and then used, used that to commercialize Cardicel in the same lab back in 1995. Then Macy, is a third generation cartilage repair product, the one that replaced Cardicel, made of the same chondrocytes seeded onto a collagen membrane. Vericel, the latest iteration of the company, um, acquired the manufacturing facility from Sanofi Genzyme back in 2014 and then commercialized Macy in 2017. I usually warn people that the next slide does have a surgical picture, so um, if you're at all squeamish, you may want to look away. So this is Cardicel. Cardicel was a suspension of cultured chondrocytes supplied in a vial, just as a, as a suspension of cells for repair of cartilage defects in the knee. It was the first approved BLA biologics license for a cell therapy product back in 1997. The benefits of this type of chondrocyte in implantation include that it creates hyaline-like cartilage, the tissue integrates with the surrounding cartilage and bone, and again, it's produced from a patient's own tissue. So people always ask, um, that second picture, the sort of before and after picture, we didn't, um, the second picture came from a patient needing another open knee procedure. We didn't just open up the patient to see the implant or how the implant was doing. So Macy, as I mentioned, the uh, product that replaced Cardicel on the market, um, it's, it's actually called a third generation cartilage repair product. It uses those same cultured chondrocytes as Cardicel, but embeds them in a collagen scaffold, which makes the surgical delivery so much simpler. It's currently only marketed in the US, but had an approved marketing application in the EU as an ATMP or advanced therapy medicinal product. Cardicel surgery required a large incision so the surg surgeon could suture a patch on top of the cartilage defect that would actually hold the chondrocytes in there. Macy simplifies this procedure significantly because the surgeon can make a much smaller incision and debride the damaged tissue to prepare the defect and then just cuts, places, and fixes the membrane with the cultured cells down into the defect. So we took a risk-based approach to detect potential contamination and ensure the safety of our products. Sterility testing is therefore performed at different points throughout the manufacturing. First, um, on in-process samples at the primary culture stage. Again, about three days before release of the product, which covers the majority of aseptic manipulations. And finally, on each product assembled. So even though we have a rapid sterility test, it currently takes seven days and products are implanted at two to four days because they're comprised of living cells. So that sterility test is not 100% complete at the time of treatment. Aerosol also uses rapid endotoxin and mycoplasma tests that both produce results within a day for lot release, which, which they're both complete before product sh shipments. So, to summarize sort of the issues that we have um, with real-time real -time release issues for microbiological tests, the primary issue is that conventional growth-based tests take weeks or even longer than a month 
and product shelf lives are measured in days or hours. So that's not compatible with a lot release test. In addition, positive results lead directly to lot rejection because there's no time to conduct failure investigations um, to actually release the lots. <coughs> Conclusions of these investigations have shown that most of the product results are false positives and they lead to rejection of perfectly good products. Rescheduling these products leads to a great deal of inconvenience for patients and makes for angry surgeons. So the first of these rapid tests that I'm going to talk about is endotoxin. For Macy, the rapid endotoxin test uses a method with a simple, straightforward workflow, making it ideal for a fast-paced QC environment. The analyst simply needs to dilute a sample, put a cartridge into a reader, enter sample information, dispense the sample into the cartridge, and then press enter to start the test. For single samples, we used a, a portable handheld reader, but as Macy has sort of taken off in the market and we're testing 10 to 15 samples a day or even more, um, we recently implemented a multi-cartridge reader that can run 10 tests in parallel. So instead of each sample being run sequentially, which takes about 15 minutes, we can run about 10 samples for endotoxin in about 30 minutes. A major advantage of this endotoxin method is that it meets all the requirements of the kinetic chromogenic pharmacopeal methods and does not require additional validation. Every sample configuration, of course, does requir require you to still determine the maximum valid dilution and the test do the test for interfering factors prior to doing routine testing described for any endotoxin test. Because the test meets compendial requirements, it really presents no regulatory hurdles to implementation. And that's what we found for Macy, <clears throat> excuse me, that's what we found for Macy with both our EU and US applications. Pardon me. <coughs> it provides quantitative results in under an hour using a very simple workflow. And we received EMA approval to use this test in 2013 for Macy and then FDA approval back in 2016. Moving on to mycoplasma, we have a mycoplasma test that can be completed in five to six hours. We used a risk-based approach to identify the most appropriate technology for rapid mycoplasma testing of our Macy final product. Nucleic acid tests primarily based on PCR were the most promising option. We chose a method based on real-time PCR and a nucleic acid stain for DNA detection to optimize the sensitivity, specificity, dynamic range, and PCR efficiency of the method. The entire method, lysis, DNA extraction, purification, and real-time analysis takes less than six hours. A positive result for the mycoplasma test needs to meet three criteria. And the, the criteria are the CT threshold value must be less than or equal to 36, indicating amplification. The melt temperature must be between 75 to 81 degrees C, which is characteristic of mycoplasma species. And then the derivative value in that melt curve um, must be greater than 0.05. It's basically just the peak height. So for an, uh, these are, we don't see these very often or ever actually in our products. What we usually see is negative results. So you're looking for the absence of a positive. And negative test results are basically just the opposite. They don't meet one or more of these three criteria. Either there's a CT value um, greater than 36, and it, uh, or a CT value that's not, uh, no, no amplification at all, no CT value. The melt temperature is outside of that specific range for mycoplasma, or the derivative value is too low, less than 0.05. We've tested over 1,000 Macy samples to date at Vericell, and they've all tested negative for mycoplasma using this new method. The validation study found that the new method's specificity and limit of detection were equivalent or better than the traditional culture method. 
For specificity, all unspiked samples were negative and spike samples were positive, and we found no cross-reactivity with closely related bacterial species. The limit of detection we found to be below 10 CFU per mil, based on the guidance in the European Pharmacopeia, and the precision and ruggedness demonstrated acceptable repeatability. Equivalence using the official method and the alternate method in parallel gave the same results using Macy clinical trial samples. So even though doing the extraction and lysis manually, we can complete the entire method in about six hours, compared, which is um, compared to the culture method, taking at least 28 days, automating the DNA extraction and purification parts using a robot reduces this time to about five hours. So the time, the elapsed time is not significantly shorter, but it's primarily unattended time where the analysts can actually be doing other things. In addition, the use of robotics improves the precision by minimizing, animus, <laughs> minimizing analyst to analyst variability. The major advantages of the mycoplasma test are speed and comparable specificity and limited detection to the official method. Automation further reduced the cost and the variability of the method. To minimize regulatory hurdles, Vericell engaged regulators early to understand their expectations. And I would really encourage anybody that's in, intending to include any sort of rapid test in an application to, to do that because it really makes the approval process much smoother. We, uh, we met with FDA um, prior to our most recent, um, recent approval in a Type C meeting. So we received the EMA approval to use this test for Macy product release in 2013, and again, FDA approval in 2016 for Macy. And sterility, so finally, sterility, we can complete this test in seven days. We began addressing the need for rapid sterility testing way back in 1999 with Cardicel, and again, this whole talk to the regulator approach early, we were discussing the validation approach and protocol with FDA at that time. We chose a growth-based method because it was similar in principle to the Combendial sterility test, except for the final detection platform. So the instrument that we chose consists of an incubator, a detection unit, and a computer system. The media bottles um, have a septum top, so you can directly inoculate the sample into the growth media, and then a CO2 sensor in the bottom, which detects when the microorganisms have started to grow. The medium contains brain heart infusion solids to promote growth, and also activated charcoal to remove antibiotics. So there's both, both aerobic and anaerobic media bottles that get incubated for every sample. The incubator then continuously agitates these bottles at 32 degrees and reads them for that color change, um, in, indicating that the, indicating the, uh, the CO2 has crossed a thir certain threshold, um, which, which, is, which is for a positive result, every 10 minutes for up to seven days. So we conducted two validation studies over a five-year period and tested 14 individual microorganism species um, that culminated in final approval by FDA in 2004 for Cardicel. The chart that you're seeing here has 10 species used in the final validation. There was some overlap in species between the two validations. So I just want you to focus on the results in blue. As you can see from the results in blue, all species were detected in less than 72 hours. Most of them were detected in less than 48 hours, except for Propionibacterium acnes, which took a little bit longer to grow. So the 48 to 72 hour timing is, is very important to ensure the safety of these cell therapy products with very short shelf lives prior to patient administration. Because if you remember that the products expire with you know within hours or days, um, Epicel has a 
has a maximum 48-hour shelf life, and Macy has a shelf life of six days. So even though we've gotten the sterility test, final product sterility test, down to seven days, it's still not complete at the time of patient administration for any of our products. So when we included this sterility test in the Macy BLA application, FDA requested additional validation of limited detection because the validation requirements for alternative microbiological methods had evolved over time since 1999. There really were no compendial, there wasn't compendial guidance on how to validate an alternative method at that time, and we, we, we worked with FDA and, and USP to, uh, to develop that protocol. But um, they, they basically looked at our original validation, which they had had input into, and said, you know, it's, it's been 20 years, and, um, and the requirements have changed, so they wanted us to do additional work. So USP 1223 now defines multiple methods, including a most probable number approach, followed by a chi-square test to demonstrate equivalent microorganism detection. So in the midst of the Macy BLA approval process in 2016, we, we ran this study as quickly as we could, and our subsequent study found, comparing the rapid method with the compendial sterility test, found the detection limit to be equivalent or better. So what does that look like? The, the LOD study tested the same dilutions of microorganisms down to extinction on both systems. And then a higher MPN, or most probable number value, um, using the rapid method would demonstrate superior detection at low inocula. So this chart shows that data for Clostridium sporogenes and the uh, the, let's see here, the, the method on the left-hand side is the rapid method, and the method on the right-hand side, labeled ST, is the compendial method. And you can see that the most probable number values using the rapid method are higher um, for, for all of the, for here. <laughs> um, so that was just one species, and we found the rapid method to be equivalent or superior to the compendial method for all of the species that we tested. So I do have a case study which demonstrates the benefits of rapid sterility testing for our application. These became evident to us in 2005. So if you remember, we got approval in 2004, and then almost right away, um, we saw the benefit when a contamination event in manufacturing affected four Cardicel final products that had been sent out. Um, so, you know, before then and since then, no contaminated products, but one contamination event um, in 2005, um, back the, uh, the uh, rapid method was, was able to pick up for us. So the rapid sterility method in blue, Cardicel, by the way, had a 72-hour or three-day shelf life. You can see the arrow on the, uh, on the chart there. So the rapid method detected each contaminated product before it could be implement, implanted into a patient. And all of those were detected in just, just below or over 24 hours. So you may look at it and say, well, the compendial test detected them all in close to three days, but the implants, I mean, that's, that's the expiry of the product. The implants tend to happen within a day or so, so the, the rapid method allowed us to interdict those products to contact the surgeons or remove them from the supply chain with FedEx and get those products back before they were ever administered to a patient. And had we been using the compendial sterility test at the time, they likely would have been implanted. So for sterility, the major advantage of this test is time to detection. And time to detection meaning how quickly we detect positives, but not necessarily how long it takes for the test to run the full seven days to detect any potential contamination that we would be testing for. So similar to the mycoplasma test, automation of this test also reduced cost and variability. To minimize regulatory hurdles, we engaged regulators early and chose a familiar growth-based test. 
We received FDA approval to use this for Cardicel in 2004, and then subsequent EMA approval for Macy in 2013, and again, the FDA did finally approve for Macy in 2016 after the additional LOD results came in. So what's next? The, as I mentioned near the start of the talk, the USP is looking at the potential for, for including a rapid sterility test in the compendium. So there would be several advantages to doing this um, in either the USP or international compendia. Um, the first is that compendial methods are considered validated as written, so companies wouldn't need to actually repeat the analytical method val validation portion. They would just need to redo the sample suitability portion, similar to the endotoxin test that I described. In addition, the compendial methods um, are official methods that don't need prior regulatory approval to use them for products, product testing. The USP Microbiology Expert Committee is evaluating a rapid sterility test for potential inclusion in the compendium. And so far, the committee has commissioned a modern microbiological methods expert panel to define user requirements for this method. When, when we met with the panel, we found that sample size and limited detection were two particularly challenging user requirements for the panel to identify. So for sample size, sample size was an issue because current sample sizes in the compendia are so small that they really only allow detection of gross contamination, and they're, but they're too large for cell therapy products which have very small batch sizes. There was one possible solution that was presented in uh, the European Pharmacopeia uh, 2627. Um, there's a table that describes potential sample sizes that could be used for could be used for cell therapy products. Limit of detection I think was probably the most challenging for the expert panel. It was an issue because demonstrating comparable detection to growth based sterility tests is a barrier to entry for many of the promising new technologies. So I guess to put it very succinctly, you might be sacrificing um, detection speed for detection or detection for speed, and ultimately the panel recommended a product-specific risk assessment to optimize the sample size, limited detection, and time to results. So to sum up, the rapid, rapid methods are critical for cell therapy products. Regulatory acceptance is possible and an official rapid method would remove current hurdles to implementation. The work in this presentation was made possible by the contribution of many key individuals. Um, just a few are named here. And I do need to make required financial disclosures for my company and want to thank people for their attention. Um, we will be taking answering all questions at the end of the presentations. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you for that, John. Uh, just to reiterate that you can uh, send in your questions via the questions tab located directly below your webinar screen, and we will go through these in the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Now please allow me to introduce our second speaker, Nicola Reed is the Senior Product Manager for Microbial Solutions Division of Charles River Laboratories. She has approximately 20 years of experience with the bacterial endotoxin test and pharmaceutical microbiology, during which time she has been involved in all aspects of the endotoxin assay, including the design and development of BET-specific instrumentation and software. She has directed workshops and training courses and lectured internationally on a variety of BET-related topics, including LAL methodologies, product validations, 21 CFR Part 11s, and BET regulatory affairs. She now works as part of the product management to ensure they are building products to their customers' requirements slash expectations and working on innovations for the future. I will now be handing over to our second presenter. Welcome, Nicola. Thank you very much. 
I'd just like to say thank you for allowing me um, the opportunity to present today and hello to everybody who is present on the call. So just to follow on from uh, John's presentation, I'm just going to talk a little about data integrity, eliminating risk and human error by utilizing the cartridge technology. And John spoke about rapid endotoxin detection and that's what I'll go into in a little bit more detail here. Okay, so what will we focus on with this talk? So we'll, we'll focus on rapid endotoxin testing with cartridge technology, why we should implement rapid endotoxin methods, how do rapid endotoxin detection methods impact the laboratory and the organization, how do we validate or qualify these methods, and realizing the actual benefits of rapid endotoxin technology. So a little about the evolution to rapid bacterial endotoxin testing and the history of cartridge technology. So Foster Jordan uh, sought to eliminate the technical flaws and weaknesses of early photometric bacterial endotoxin test methods by creating a new test platform upon which reagents are dried. So these are the cartridges are polystyrene cartridges and they contain pre-calibrated reagents that have known reaction times with RSC, that's reference standard endotoxin that are determined by a handheld spectrophotometer. An archive standard curve is created from the known uh, RSC values so that preparation of daily standard curves is unnecessary. A little about the uniqueness of the LAL cartridge. So it's a compendial assay, and I know John referred to this also in his slides earlier. So it's a kinetic chromogenic assay, and it's accepted by regulatory agents as compendial. So it is not an alternative um, endotoxin test, it is a compendial test. So the only requirement is to do your product validation, which we will discuss um, further on. Real-time results. You get real-time results in approximately 15 minutes. So we have various sensitivities of cartridges, and the, the full test time is approximately 15 minutes. It's ease of use, it cuts down the time it takes the laboratory to train and qualify new and existing analysts. And the things it eliminates is the user prepared endotoxin standards, which is one of the main sources of human error um, because those uh, standards are already um, pre done, pre calibrated, so there's no requirement to prepare the standard curve. Variability in PPC preparations that is eliminated because the positive control is already on the cartridge for you. And the use and qualification of multiple accessories. There are far less accessories needed and required in, when utilizing cartridges in, con, in comparison with gel clot testing or um, traditional kinetic plate methods. So what are these cartridges? So we were FDA licensed in 2006. You can run one sample per cartridge. It utilizes an archived standard curve. It comes with duplicate sample and spiked wells. So if you can see on the image here, uh, channel one and channel three are our sample channel. Channel two and four have a known um, endotoxin addition. You can see that as the, as the first placement in, the, in those channels. That is the spike, that is the positive control channel. So you have duplicate sample, duplicate positive control <clears throat> as required by a regulatory. It's a kinetic chromogenic assay in approximately 15 minutes. And it provides calibration that is directly tied to the primary endotoxin standard, RSE. All other methods use a secondary endotoxin standard, which is a control standard endotoxin, the CSE. So how do the cartridges work? It's really quite simple. So you take um, 25 microliters of your sample preparation and you add 25 microliters to each of the wells here. Just, under, uh, just above the numbers one, two, three, and four on the handle of the cartridge. So it's 25 microliters of your sample preparation. So that's your diluted sample, or uh, if you test undiluted, like water, that just goes straight in here. You press start on the instrument uh, or on the software, depending on which instrument you're using. It pulls the sample in. It mixes it with each of the reagent stations that are here. It moves it to the optical cell, and it starts to take readings. Just having some issues moving the slide on, just bear with me. <clears throat> Make sure I haven't gone too far yet. Okay. Okay. 
<clears throat> so what benefits do organizations uh, realize with rapid endotoxin um, methods? A seamless and efficient validation and qualification of in-process, end-of-process, final product, and water samples. Laboratory efficiency allows for better allocation of highly trained and skilled analysts. And I know John referred to that. So all of that time that you save in sample preparation, uh, preparing the assay, running the assay, and uh, those highly skilled analysts can be allocated elsewhere to do other tasks. It gives more effective control over a firm's risk for endotoxin out of specification, leading to a reduction in the frequency of investigation. It gives a strengthening of a firm's stance on data integrity regulations and reduces their exposure to human error. So there's no preparation of standard curves or positive controls. Um, so therefore, there's less human error, less hands-on time with this asset. Okay. So regarding the regulatory requirements and expectations, so we've listed here what are the USP requirements for bacterial endotoxin testing and how the uh, cartridge-based systems compare with that. So as you can see, as you're running through here, um, everything compares as to what is required. Water negative controls, uh, it states for the uh, regulatory requirements that a minimum requirement of two replicates. The purpose of the negative control is to verify the absence of detectable con concentration of endotoxin in water for bacterial endotoxin tests. And for the cartridges, <clears throat> this can be achieved with the PTS, excuse me, <clears throat> by running a cartridge before or after testing a sample with the LRW that was used for the dilutions. So if you have to dilute your sample and you have to use some kind of diluent, whether that be lyle reagent water or something else, you can test that separately then. Um, if, your sound, if your result is clean in your sample, then there's no need to check the diluents. Everything is, is clean and absent of endotoxin. If you recover endotoxin in your sample, then you'll need to test the diluent just to ensure that is the contamination coming from the actual sample or is it coming from the diluent. So this is where you need the negative control at that time. Okay. Test for interfering factors. USP requires unspiked samples and spiked samples in duplicate. The PTS is set to run that um, in the same manner as we showed you on the cartridges. So we comply uh, with the regulatory expectations and we're using kinetic chromogenic reagents on the cartridges. So how do I validate my product with rapid endotoxin technology? So as we said before, it's a compendial method, so it's not an alternative method. All you need to do is validate your product. And it's the same as you would do for any other endotoxin test, so for gel clot, kinetic turbidometric, kinetic chromogenic. You first run your interference screen, and this is conducted to find a compatible test concentration. Um, so the criteria, as, you, as many of you will be aware, is 50 to 200% spike recovery. You're looking that you have to be within that range. Outside of that range shows uh, inhibition or enhancement. And you're hoping to work around the 100% or as close to the 100% mark as you can. We do actually provide uh, inhibition enhancement cartridges. And all the four channels are spiked channels. So it gives you um, a, an idea of what the spike recoveries will be. And then you can take that over to the actual uh, main test cartridges, which are in duplicate. Step two, product validation, uh, performed on three different lots of your products using the non-interfering concentration or dilution chosen from the interference screen. You can use FDA licensed LAL cartridges um, for this product validation, and they must be qualified. And again, the criteria is 50 to 200% for spike recovery. So it's exactly the same as any other compendial uh, bacterial endotoxin test. So just to go a little bit over efficiency and, and what the cartridge technology can bring um, to laboratories. So cartridge and automated robotic endotoxin technologies allow laboratories to better utilize the highly trained and highly educated scientists and analysts. And how does it do this? It prevents burnout and increases employee job satisfaction. You're not just sitting there preparing standard curves all day, preparing microtiter micro plates or, or tubes. It's a very, very quick test with very minimal preparation time, and therefore those expertise can be used in other areas. It allows scientists and analysts to focus on more value-added laboratory activities. Um, such as microbiology method validation activities, cross-training, lean laboratory initi initiatives, and so on. 
It allows for effective and efficient investigation control. So Cartage Technology modernizes laboratory investigation and control strategies. As it says here, most organizations that conduct business in regulated industries carry out investigations utilizing an organized approach such as Six Sigma or Jamaic. I'm sure many of you on this call are using those kind of approaches. These investigations typically involve cross-functional teams, uh, which includes a lead investigator, the QC manager, the analyst uh, representatives, and manufacturing management representatives. Cartridge and robotic systems make the investigation process more efficient by reducing laboratory retest rates to effectively reducing the amount of investigations performed. So there are um, a lot less retest rates with uh, cartridge technology. This is because there's less manipulation of the standard curve, the positive product controls, and the samples. And therefore, with less retest rates, there are less investigations to process. So how does the risk for human error impact data integrity compliance? The risk for human error in all processes um, persists when there's a high level of subjectivity in obtaining results, um, such as the gel clot, traditional gel clot assay. Coupled with the natural human tendency to make mistakes and errors, and we're all only human, we're all going to make some kind of error um, in the laboratory or, or our everyday lives as we move forward. So the process involving many human manipulations, interactions, um, it, it then starts to introduce more error. And so the more manipulations we have, the more we have to prepare for a specific assay, the more introduction of human error we have. To so evaluate the risk for human error. So risk for human error leads to data integrity compliance gaps. So we're just going to look at some subjective processes here. So human recorded, what is subjective? Human recorded observations are prevalent forms of data recording and reporting in many pharmaceutical microbiology laboratories. Many examples of this include, but are not limited to, so in the traditional bioburden assay, counting of colonies on plates, and recording results is highly subjective and requires duplication of efforts for verification of results. As we're talking about endotoxin testing, we must look to the gel clot test. So the gel clot results are compiled by an analyst searching for a clot in a tube. This method is highly subjective and also requires duplication of efforts for verification of results. So when you're turning that tube, is it a solid clot? Is it not? Different people have different interpretations of that, and therefore it, it can be subjective. So error-proof your process with rapid methods, and cartridge technology and laboratory automation can, can assist with that. So we start at the least effective method, um, which is repeating the same task or effort in order to identify or avoid an error. So the gel clot test, you may have to have what we call a four eyes principle, where um, two analysts are looking at the result before the result is recorded. Then we move on to detect and recover the ability to find errors and get back to the original state and minimize impact of error. So here we're, kind of, we're looking more at the traditional um, kinetic methods that are run on microplates or in tube readers. Then we can look to error prevention, and this is the ability to use signals or devices to avoid error. And this is where our um, portable test system or multiple cartridge systems come into play. Um, there's a lot less um, opportunity for error or chance of error because there are a lot less steps in actually running the assay. And then we move up to the most effective um, um, error proofing, which is eliminating the possibility of making an error. It's designed so human error is impossible, and this is our robotic system that uses our cartridge technology. So you're already eliminating um, a lot of error utilizing the cartridges. When you move that up to using the cartridges of the robotic system, you're eliminating a huge amount of, of human error and, and issue. So realizing the benefits of rapid endotoxin testing. So again, just to talk about the cartridge technology, it utilizes the compendial endotoxin assay and reagent. It is our FDA-licensed kinetic chromogenic reagent that is on these cartridges. It reduces variability by all reagents are included in each cartridge in the correct amount for testing. You're not having to reconstitute lysate or make a standard curve or prepare positive controls. Everything is already in the cartridge for you. So all standard curves are prepared and compared back to the reference standard endotoxin, which is used by industry. Mm. 
Okay, so we'll just talk a little bit about the cartridge technology and the evolution. So as we say, it uses FDA licensed Endosafe Chromogenic LAL reagents. The Endosafe NextGen PTS is a point of use detection system. So that's our um, portable system which tests one cartridge at a time. Then we have our Endosafe NextGen multiple cartridge system. And this can test five cartridges at a time. So that's five cartridges within approximately 15 minutes. I know John referred earlier to um, 10 tests in 30 minutes, and, and, and this is where this comes from. And then we have the Nexus, which is a fully automated system for high volume testing. So the next gen PTS, as I've already said, and it's, um, it's compliant with the cartridges are compliant um, with the um, compendial testing. We have quantitative results in approximately 15 minutes. It has an embedded operating system for true portability. It's designed for wireless capability for um, remote system access and data exporting and printing, and we have fleet management capabilities. For all of our cartridges, we have um, ranges of detection between 10 and 005. So we have a few different standard curve ranges dependent on your products and your needs. And the software um, that is embedded on this portable system is um, fully compliant and validated and follows the requirements for 21 CFR Part 11. Our next gen MCS is very similar to the PTS. It has five, five bays instead of the one bay, but it has to be driven by um, a PC-based software. So it's not a portable system, it's a, it's a bench top system. And that software is our Endoscan V software. Uh, again, it's compliant, compliant software. We also have functionality for gram ID testing. So we have, uh, we don't just have endotoxin testing cartridges. We have gram identification cartridges, beta glucan cartridges. And as I mentioned earlier, we have the inhibition enhancement cartridges for when you're doing product validation. And then we have our Nexus system. This is a fully automated robotic system designed specifically for testing in a central quality control laboratory. It ties together with our cartridge technology and full autom uh, automation of liquid handling and simple data management. So it's ultra-efficient endotoxin testing, testing up to 60 samples per run with zero analyst hands-on time. It reduces bacterial endotoxin test variability, thereby reducing the amount of investigations that you would have to conduct. It improves laboratory efficiency and reduces the risk for data integrity violations by integrating with LIMS. So again, just to go over increasing lab efficiency with automation, if you're fully automated, the analyst only needs to add barcoded samples and cartridges to the deck of the robotic system. And this eliminates a firm's risk for human error. As we mentioned, it tests up to 60 samples per run with minimal analyst hands-on time. It has a shift and scan barcode reader which adds sample information seamlessly. The robotic liquid handler prepares sample dilutions, it pipettes samples into cartridges and performs all the tasks related to endotoxin testing using the cartridge system. Okay. It utilizes the fully compliant Nexus software, which again has gone through our validation uh, process, CFR 21 compliance, and we, we look to data integrity compliance also with our software. So this is just an overview of that Nexus fully automated process workflow from sample collection through to deck preparation, starting the automation, then the samples, everything goes through, it is tested, and then you get the final results. So really it is just um, whoever's taking the samples still takes the samples. The deck preparation, as mentioned, is just adding the cartridges, any pipette tips that need to be uh, added on there, and then the rest is automated from there. Okay. I've already gone through that information. And I'd just like to mention also um, that there's many discussions out there about um, reducing uh, LAL in endotoxin testing and how that can be done. And with our cartridge technology, we actually use 90% of the reagent that, and the raw material that is used in a traditional microplate test. So uh, we're, by utilizing cartridge technology, we're cutting back on 90% of the LAL required for a traditional test. 
So even though it's it, it's still compliant, it's still kinetic chromogenic, it's reducing the need for um, LAL and for bleeding horseshoe crabs considerably. So that really, really helps towards the horseshoe crab conservation efforts that Charles River are involved in also. Okay, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. Now we will begin the question and answer segment of the webinar, but once again, I would like to remind our audience that you can still send in your questions via the questions tab located directly below your webinar screen. So now our first question is, for autologous cell therapy products, I'm imagining that contamination risk is most associated with the collection of the tissue and transport slash handling of that tissue prior to growth. How can the risk be minimized? John, would you like to answer this question first? I assume that one was for me. <laughs> so actually, there are uh, four main areas of contamination risk. Um, there's the donor tissue itself, raw materials, cross-contamination, and personnel. So contamination from donor tissue is largely due to the skill of the surgeon taking the biopsy and minimized by a surgeon training program that we have in place, and also the use of antibiotics in the transport medium. We control raw material contamination by a rigorous incoming raw material inspection and testing program. Um, patient lot segregation, environmental controls, and process validation minimize the cross-contamination risk. And finally, training, qualification, and detailed SOPs minimize contamination due to personnel. Thank you. Nicola, do you have anything to add to that? That was for No, oh. nothing else. <laughs> oh, no problem. Our next question, thank you, is can you elaborate on how slash when rapid microbiological methods should be developed to facilitate real-time release on these products? John, would you like to take this? Uh, sure. Um, since, uh, since these are patient-specific products with short shelf lives um, and we typically have to release the product on the same day, um, we need to implement methods that take less than a day. So we start method development very early in the product development process to allow adequate time for validation so that we can include the rapid methods in regulatory marketing applications as alternatives to the, to the um, compendial methods. Um, I noticed another question on the web that was kind of similar to that. That one was called, let's see, oh, early engagement with regulatory authorities. This is what it says. Regarding early engagement with regulatory authorities, how far in advance of the intended use of the RMM do you recommend starting this engagement? And basically, I would say you want to, uh, you want to, it depends where you are in the product development life cycle. If you already have a product on the market, then, I mean, obviously it's almost, it's, it's too late. I mean, you, you want to talk to them, which we did for Cardisol, you'd want to talk to regulators before actually embarking on some sort of validation program. But ideally, if you don't have products on the market, you're going to be somewhere in the product development life cycle, right? And I think phase one, um, clinical trial phase one, is probably a little too early. You really want to talk to regulators as soon as possible, but I'd say probably by phase three, you want to have those methods uh, nailed down. So before phase three would be the best time to do that. Thank you for that. Uh, Nicola, do you have anything to add to this? No, no. Our next question then, thank you, is are the cartridges licensed by the FDA in the same way that FDA licenses LAL? Nicola, I believe this one is for you. Yes, yes, I can take that one, thank you. Yes, they are FDA licensed. So as I said earlier, we use our kinetic chromogenic um, reagents and that is on the cartridges and they are under our FDA license. Um, each batch that we manufacture of our cartridges goes um, to the FDA um, before we release. Perfect. And on the back of that question, uh, is the cartridge technology recognized by the regulatory authorities as a standard method or an alternative method? Yes, it's recognized as a compendial method, as the kinetic chromogenic method within the pharmacopoeia. It isn't an alternative method. I know there's lots of discussions now surrounding alternative methods. Um, what falls under that category for endotoxin testing is recombinant factor C, so that will be classed as an alternative method, whereas the cartridge-based method is compendial. So there's only the requirement to do your um, product validation and not you don't have to do any other uh, work behind that. It's, it's very straightforward. I think John explained that also in his presentation. It was very quick to get through regulatory approval. 
John, did you have anything you wanted to add on the back of that? Um, I can just support that, that um, both of the both of the approval processes that we went through, there were questions, but when um, when we explained that the cartridge technology was the compendial method to the agencies, they, uh, they were fine with that. Thank you. Our next question is, can you briefly describe how a risk-based approach during development mitigates issues of contamination for autologous cell therapy products? John, would you like to answer this question first? Uh, sure. Um, so there's actually two areas that we've taken a risk-based approach. First, for contamination control, and second, for developing, validating, and implementing rapid methods. So for contamination control, um, as for the sterility test, we don't have time to wait for the sterility test to fin finish, a growth-based sterility test to finish its entire incubation. So as I sort of mentioned in that, in that earlier slide that went through the Macy process, we use a risk-based contamination approach by testing at many points in the process. First, during the primary, primary stage before cryopreservation, um, then just prior to product release, and then actually at the final product stage. Now, for the, um, for the developing, validating, and implementing, um, we, we used a failure mode and effects analysis to identify the most likely design failures and process failures prior to validation and implementation. And we also used a um, sort of informal risk assessment to choose the, uh, choose the rapid test that we were going to use. Thank you. And Nicola, do you have anything you want to add on how a risk-based approach during development mitigates issues of contamination for autologous cell therapy products? No, I think John covered everything there. Perfect. Our next question uh, is, how much LAL is in a cartridge? Is it the same as a standard method? Uh, Nicola, I believe this is for you. Yeah, absolutely. So that's what I mentioned um, just at the end of my presentation. So we have a commitment to horseshoe crab conservation within Charles River. We're very passionate about that and protecting uh, the horseshoe crab um, within the environment. And uh, they are a protected species um, where we collect them um, in, in South Carolina. So as we were moving forward with looking for innovative technologies and, and we moved forward with the cartridge-based technology that allowed us to reduce the amount of LAL and raw material required for a test. So as I said, it's, it's 1 20th, which is um, 1 20th of the LAL required from a standard test, which is 90% less reagent required in a cartridge assay than it is in a standard assay. Thank you. Our next question is, what sample types do most of your customers utilize the rapid endotoxin technology, for example, water, raw materials? We actually have um, a huge mix across the globe who are utilizing um, either the uh, portable system, which is the next gen PTS, or the multiple cartridge system, or even the Nexus systems. So um, a lot of the high throughput tends to be much more water-based um, and testing, but we have people testing uh, incoming raw materials, in process samples, and final product, uh, as well as water. So it's right across the board that people are using this technology. Thank you. John, do you have anything to add on top of that? Uh, no, I didn't have anything to add. No problem. Our next question is uh, someone was asking about the equipment used for testing 10 samples in 30 minutes for BET. Uh, John, would you like to talk about that equipment? Sure. Um, and there are actually, there are a number of questions on here that we're asking for um, specific manufacturing information. And the intent of this presentation was, of this webinar was to be non-promotional. So um, for, the, uh, for the bacterial endotoxin test, I think it's pretty obvious that it was Charles River. Um, but if people have specific questions, they can feel free to email me, and um, I, can, I can be a little bit more specific. Um, is that okay? Yep, that's perfect. Uh, Nico, do you have anything you want to add on your own uh, equipment? Yes, so our specific equipment for the cartridge technology um, can run um, a sample um, in 15 minutes. If you have the multiple cartridge system, you can run five samples in 15 minutes. And then we go up to the robotic system, which can run approximately 60 samples in around four hours, depending on the sample type. Thank you. And our please, final question will be, 
I want to hear your thoughts on the proposed USP 1071 informational chapter, uh, Rapid Sterility of Short-Lived Products, and its position that there is no need to validate LOD down to a single cell. Uh, John, would you like to take this question first? Uh, sure. Let's make sure I'm not on mute. So um, I guess my answer would be as long as there's no requirement. So I guess the, the, the short answer is it depends. As long as there's no requirement to show equivalence to the compendial method, I think a product-specific risk assessment could justify a higher limit of detection than a single cell. So again, it's probably going to depend on where you are in the product development life cycle. So if, you have, if you're putting a method in a new application and you validate it for a cell therapy product and you have previous regulatory interaction and buy-in, then that's going to be a different, different question than if you have a, a method already in an approved application that you need to show equivalence to, um, it's going to be a bit of a tougher road. And Nicola, do you have anything to add on the, the validation of LOD down to a single cell? No, no. Perfect. Our next question, um, we have time for a couple more, is does each PCR reaction require positive controls using control mycoplasma DNA? Nicola, would you like to take this question first? I think this one is probably more for John. For John? Yes, no problem. I can take that one. Mm -hmm. um, so for the rapid mycoplasma test, there's actually negative, so there's a plate negative control, there's a plate positive control, there's an extraction control for each sample, and then there's also an inhibition control that's run with each sample. So I think this is probably getting to, um, you know, is there a possible, is there possibility to contaminate your samples with mycoplasma DNA? And the positive control that's used for, um, the, for the technology we're using is actually a discriminatory positive control. So that uses mycoplasma DNA that's been engineered to, to melt. If you remember the, the positive versus negatives, there was a melt temperature that was specific to mycoplasma. It's been bioengineered. It's mycoplasma DNA that's been bioengineered to melt at a different temperature so that you can tell if you've contaminated your plate with positive control versus actual mycoplasma. On the back of that question then, uh, for the rapid mycoplasma test, do you have issues with false positive results due to DNA fragments and not actual live mycoplasma? Uh, we really haven't seen any of those issues and um, it's probably most likely due to the fact that at the very beginning of our sample prep, we have a high-speed centrifugation, uh, centrifugation step to pellet the mycoplasma organisms. And since um, DNA is soluble, it pretty much rinses off with the supernatant if there was any there. Um, also, the prevalence of mycoplasma contamination is not nearly the same as it would be for you know, a, a conventional bacterium or fungi. So I think if you tried to use this exact same technology to test you know, for a broad range of bacteria, um, there would probably be a, light, a higher likelihood of getting some bacterial DNA fragments in there, but it, we have not seen that problem. Thank you. And with that, I will conclude the question and answer segment. But before I finish the webinar, I would like to ask our presenters, John DeGood and Nicola Reed, if they have any closing remarks or final statements. There's nothing from me. Thank you very much. No, and just uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak. And um, I hope people will take this as sort of a call to action to try and implement rapid methods because they are really the wave of the future and um, they make use of the latest technologies and regulators are starting to accept them. So um, go forth. <laughs> Well, thank you. And I would like to take this opportunity on behalf of the audience to thank our presenters, once again, John DeGood and Nicola Reed for sharing their knowledge with us. I would like to also remind our audience that they can view this and other webinars on demand by visiting biopharma-asia.com forward slash on demand hyphen webinars. And if you're watching on demand, uh, please email any questions to me at s-t-e-p-h-e-n dot edwards at biopharma-asia.com. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.